what I'm going to move on to at this point is the sort of evolution of the idea of a bus, right? Basically sort of try and indicate what are some limitations on what can be achieved using a bus and what is a po one possible solution, right? Especially when you move to larger and larger systems, okay? So uh, many of the slides over here are borrowed from Professor Anand Raghunathan of Purdue University. What are the problems with buses or rather what happens as you try to scale buses to larger and larger systems and how do you deal with those problems. So before we get into network on chips, I want to sort of bring in some more issues uh, related to the whole idea of the buses as we have understood them so far. Okay. So you recall in the last class, I mentioned something called DMA, right? the direct memory access. And typically what happens is that, you know, in terms of a real system, I would have a bus, there would be CPUs, right? So I could, for example, have a CPU 0, a CPU 1, etc. multiple CPUs that are talking to this. Peripherals, right? P1, P2, etc. Right? Some n different peripherals. And as I said, one of the issues that happens often, right? Uh, and of course, I could also, you know, along with these peripherals, I might also have memory. Right? You could, in principle, think of memory also as a type of peripheral. But in a lot of cases, it makes sense to sort of think of it as something different, right? I mean, it's not a generic peripheral. It is something which uh, usually has low latency, high throughput, and so on. So it has sort of more specialized behavior than a generic peripheral, okay? And is also one of the things that is fundamentally required. Without memory, you pretty much cannot build a computer system. But most peripherals, you might be able to do away with. All right. So one thing that ha happens often in such a system is that the CPUs are primarily meant for doing computation, right? They have their ALUs and the whole idea is that, you know, you have some data sitting in the registers of the CPU and uh, some computations are happening in there, right? Now, as long as that computation is happening in the reg between registers, right, there is effectively no bus activity, okay? I mean, there is still... You know, depending on how the system is set up, you might have an instruction bus which is still active, right? But as long as you use an instruction cache and so on, right, that would be sort of separated out from the system bus and would not really impact any thing happening on the system bus, okay? So what that means is that the CPU is busy doing some arithmetic type of computations, but I need to get a chunk of data from some peripheral P1 to memory or from memory to some other peripheral or between two peripherals, right? The normal way to do this in a memory mapped system would be the CPU, one of the CPUs has to basically do load and store, right? Literally doing nothing in between. It's just loading from one location, storing into another location and probably incrementing both the from and to addresses, right? And that's it. This type of operation is basically something called a mem copy, right? It's called a mem copy in general because it basically copies a chunk of data from one range of memory locations to another or rather address locations to another, okay? Now, whether that is actually those address locations correspond to memory or to peripherals is irrelevant as long as we use a memory mapped uh, architecture, right? So for example, if I'm directly trying to take something from an ethernet device and copy it out into some other, you know, the a disk or something of that sort, I could possibly even completely bypass memory and, you know, still use a memcopy type operation in order to get this work done. Okay. So the DMA unit basically comes in over here, right? And its job is precisely this. It is a type of bus master. And the only kind of thing that it can do is bus activity, right? Transferring data from one memory range to another, okay? Now, the whole idea why it was introduced in the first place was to reduce the pressure on the CPU, right? You don't need to do so many load stores. You might be able to get by with a mem copy, okay? How does a DMA work? 
it has to know from where to copy uh, what is the source and the destination for the copy right and that information ultimately can only come from the cpu because the cpu is actually executing a program right which tells it that it needs to take a chunk of data from one place and put it into another so in that sense dma can also act as a type of slave but this is purely for the configuration aspects right in other words the configuration part of things would mean that one of the cpus has to directly write some data into the dma telling it okay copy data from here to here okay now this is very generally not the case between cpus which is why you will generally see that the cpu is referred to only as a, uh, as a master whereas the dma also has a slave functionality it needs the ability to get information from the uh, cpu that configures it and tells it what to do okay now as we saw earlier there can be this problem that some peripherals are slow some are fast some you know uh, depending on how much memory i'm trying to copy uh, if there is a dram there is extra latency all of that there are multiple different modes of operation for dma right and one of the things that it generally needs to do is to try and work in gaps wherever the cpus are not trying to access the bus okay and uh, in the past at least there used to be this concept called cycle stealing dma which was essentially trying to sort of make use of the fact that occasionally whenever it finds an ideal cycle it will take up the job of copying data right but whenever the cpu needs to transfer data on the bus it will immediately get access to that nowadays this is not a very common term there are multiple reasons for that one of them is the fact that you know you have these more complex buses which are capable of sort of burst transactions and so on so you don't really want to complicate the way that you are going to sort of uh, break up an individual transaction on the other hand one thing that is very common nowadays is something called scatter gather dma right where what you basically say is because you also need to allocate a certain amount of memory for getting the data and in general depending on the traffic you don't know how much memory might be needed you might need to create a series of small buffers and you know uh, as and when buffers become free you basically allocate one of those and use that in order to copy the data and once the data is now sitting in memory you can decide what to do with it the processor either does something with it or it stores it onto disk or uh, Uh, you know sends it to the network stack or something else okay so dma also has multiple different modes in which it can operate once again this is only for information right it's not something that i expect you to sort of sit and say what are the different modes in which dma can operate now one of the problems that comes the moment you have multiple masters right is priority or arbitration right if two masters want the bus at the same time who should get it now this occurs even in the case that you just have two cpus or it could come even in the case that i have a single cpu and a dma right and the question then basically becomes now i have two bus masters trying to copy data from some memory location to some other memory location which one should get access to the bus at a given point in time right or let's say that one of them is copying a large chunk of data another one wants to get some data at the same time should i stop the first transaction and let the second one go ahead is there some reason why you know one has a higher priority than the other and so on right so this whole idea of arbitration priority is something which like i said you know there is a separate unit called an arbiter that has to take care of that okay now it's fine to say that the arbiter will take care of that the question then becomes how should the arbiter do it okay and one of the possibilities of course the most obvious one probably is something called static priority assignment and what i mean by that is cpu is always given highest priority okay so let's say that somehow at a given point in time there are two uh, masters that want to communicate on the bus okay now you might think that you know what kind of coincidence is this that the cpu as well as the dma both of them come and say they want the bus at exactly the same time right wouldn't won't they be off by at least one clock cycle well what if there was another transaction going on right so let's say that cpu 0 was in the middle of a transaction during that time cpu 1 decided it needed something from the bus 
the DMA also decided, or rather, the DMA also had been given instructions that it needed to transfer data somewhere on the bus. Okay. Now, what would happen in such a situation is, uh, you know, I, I would have something like CPU zero is going on. Let's say DMA comes in here, CPU one comes in here. Question is, who gets the transaction next? Okay. And if the CPUs are given higher priority, what will happen is the CPU one will come in here. The DMA is still waiting. Okay. During this time, let's say that CPU zero comes in again. What happens? DMA continues to wait, right? Because CPU zero gets it. This is assuming, of course, that I have statically given priority, saying that the CPUs have higher priority than DMA. Okay. So you can see why, although very simple to implement, this might be a bad idea, right? You can essentially lead to something like starvation. Right? Meaning that the DMA is waiting, it indefinitely waits for access to the bus and never gets it. Okay. One way of getting around that is, you know, there, there are multiple different ways of getting around it. Uh, well, okay. One of the ways of getting around it would be to do something called time division. Okay. Where I literally say that, you know, I would have something like I divide up my entire time into slots. And let's say that CPU zero comes in here it basically gets this. So it goes to CPU zero, right? Now, in fact, what I do is I basically say that this is now going to be for CPU one, this is going to be for DMA. Then again, I have CPU zero, CPU one, etc., right? Which means that DMA doesn't matter where it comes in, will only get access out here, okay? What happens over here? Let's say that CPU one, did not have anything to transfer, right? If I go with pure time division, then basically what it means is that I am still going to end up leaving that slot blank because I want to make sure that I cannot have a situation where these uh, devices are going to basically, uh, you know, not get access, right? Because of this priority business, okay? On the other hand, you can see that this is clearly a bad idea. What I could have done instead would have been, you know, just put all of them in a queue as in when the requests come in, put them in a queue and give the next slot to the next available system, right? So basically this would then become CPU zero comes over here. It goes in at this point. DMA comes in over here. It goes in here, right? So this becomes CPU zero. This becomes DMA. Then let's say that immediately after that, in fact, I also get CPU one, right? That ends up go uh, going out here. Okay. And during this time, if there is another DMA that comes in, it would then go in here and so on. Okay. So it's not necessary that it has to go in any cyclic order. It basically goes into some kind of a queue, right? And as and when the queue is there, all that I've done is I've broken these things up into specific time slots and said so much time is available for your transfer. Okay. Looks like a good idea, right? The catch is ultimately that, you know, these are fixed time slots. Okay. What if I only want to transfer a couple of bytes? I just want to like, you know, retrieve one word from memory. Okay. Then I don't really need a large time slot. So maybe I could get by with small time slots. But if I go and make the time slots very small, what if I actually want to copy one kilobyte of data, right? The DMA, it will basically get broken up into a very large number of small transactions, okay? So time slotting like this by itself does not solve the problem, okay? There are multiple different methods that have been proposed. And in fact, you know, if you go and look at the uh, relevant literature, basically a whole bunch of IEEE and ACM papers talking about uh, many different methods of sort of, you know, balancing bus arbitration, right? Can you have some kind of a lottery based system, some randomized system, right? Which basically tries to give equal priority to different, uh, different devices. There is something called CDMA, which is code division multiple access. This is actually a completely different approach to the bus. What it says is multiple things can actually talk on the bus at the same time, right? And uh, 
those of you who work on communication systems might be familiar with CDMA. It's primarily used in, uh, a, or it, nowadays it's probably not so popular, but it, it is a primarily came up as a form of communication, right? Wireless communication, where they said that rather than sort of time dividing the uh, slots and saying, you know, each uh, device is uh, allowed to talk at this particular time instant, you do this kind of code division, which allows multiple devices to just talk at the same time. Right. And because of the properties of the way that the bits are modulated, you will be able to actually recover the one that you are interested in at any given point in time. So there are many different ways by which you can handle this arbitration and priority. But once again, hopefully, you know, you sort of are already concluding, right, based on what we have discussed so far, that there's no one answer that satisfies all the possible scenarios, right. And an example is this basically, right? I mean, so what we are saying is that uh, this was an analysis done by uh, Professor Anand's group, uh, you know, once before. Essentially, the, what they said was, let's say that you have four different devices that are trying to communicate on a bus. What they did was they assumed that all four of them are trying to communicate, meaning that, you know, they are all interested in, uh, they all have some amount of data to be sent, okay? Small bursts of data but enough to sort of occupy a large part of the bandwidth of the system. So in other words, the total amount of data that all four want to communicate is more than the total available bandwidth in the system. Okay. And the question is, do you have some kind of fairness, right? What I mean by fairness is, can you sort of say that, you know, based on some priority allocation, all four of them will at least get some access to the bus. Okay. Now, these numbers at the bottom, this 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 4, 3, etc., what they are saying is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, for example, says one uh, processor 1 has the lowest priority, 2 has next, 3 is next after that, and 4 has the highest priority. Okay. And what happens as a result? Effectively, what you can see is, you know, of course, this also depends on how much data these things are generating, right? This is what is plotted over here is based on some kind of random simulations, right, where each one of them is generating a certain amount of data. I, I don't remember those numbers exactly. But what you should look at is more the qualitative aspect of this rather than the exact quantities, right. What this effectively says is C1 has no access to the bus. C4 has lots of access. Of course, it has the highest priority, but the point is, even though it has the highest priority, I would ideally not like to have a situation where C1 is completely starved, right? I don't want uh, C1 to never get access to the bus. And effectively, what this is saying is, because the other three are still trying to communicate, right? C2 still manages to get something in once in a while. And the reason that happens is because C3 and C4, you know, yes, they are communicating a lot, but it's not to the point where they are completely hogging the bus. But whenever a chance comes up, C2 is the one that gets it and C1 never gets a chance at the bus at all. Now, as you change this, right, 1, 2, 4, 3, you find that over here, 3 and 4 sort of switch places, right? The amount of, uh, the size of the block corresponding to 3 and 4 sort of uh, changes, right? 1, 3, 2, 4, each of those. In fact, if you look at it, you can pretty much realize that, you know, each of those blocks is pretty much a fixed size and just depending on the order in which it's been put, the it sort of shuffles around to different parts of the uh, chart. Okay. Now, what is this illustrating? It's basically telling you that there is a problem with any kind of static priority assignment. Okay. In other words, if I always have this thing where C1, C2, C3, C4 have any fixed priority, you will run into some kinds of problems when the data traffic gets high enough. Okay. How do I prevent that? How do I sort of say that, you know, I can do some kind of balancing, right? One way to do that would be dynamic priority, right? I could sort of have a counter which says, okay, you know, as C4 gets more and more access to the bus, that counter sort of goes down, which implicitly is lowering its priority. And C1 has been waiting for more and more time. Its priority starts going up little by little until its priority is higher than C4 and you know it's going to definitely get some access to the bus. Okay. So many kinds of different dynamic priority allocation schemes have also been discussed. The point over here is that you might need to look at something of that sort. Static priority by itself may not be enough. 
the other thing, you know, this is coming back to the idea of uh, TDMA slot reservation. Uh, so in other words, what it's saying is, you know, depending on when the request came, the request from master one came just before the time slot for one. So the waiting time is very small, right? Whereas over here, the waiting time request from master one came over here, the waiting time becomes 13. It has to wait until it actually gets access to the bus, right? So in other words, the amount of time that you have to wait also starts depending on things like what are the sizes of the time slots, how much time you have to wait and so on, okay? And also when your request came, all of these things are perfectly fine, right? One variant or other of these is definitely going to be sufficient for most single processor plus DMA systems. And in fact, even for systems that have multiple processors with, but as long as the number of masters is small, okay? And hopefully the number of slaves is also small and the variation between slaves, that is the latency of the slaves is not too large and so on, okay? So subject to that, you know, it's a fairly sort of constrained kind of uh, system you should be able to work out fairly well. In other words, this entire business, either a static priority or some form of dynamic priority or a time division uh, slot reservation, there are one of those different variants on the bus should be sufficient to meet all your requirements.